Okay. Um, I flew in this morning and reread Alice's wonderful memoir because I read it probably a year ago in Galley and I wanted to remember what it was like. And one of the things that it did was bring back to me the Berkeley that we used to live in. And it is a remarkably frank book. And one of the things I want to ask you is like, why did you write this book? <laughs> <laughs> I was obliged to write it. <laughs> it was part of a contract that I had with the publisher <laughs> for the two other books I really wanted to write. And they said, well, if we go with the two other books, uh, we'll, we need one more if you want to get this good contract. And so I, I didn't think anything about it. I just said, fine. And the two other, The Art of Simple Food 1 and 2, were written. And then they said, you have to write a memoir. And I said, well, I'm not sure I can. You know, maybe I should give back the money. <laughs> and my agent said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I had to think of a way to do it that, um, that helped me remember what had happened to me, and I knew that it couldn't be about the early days at the restaurant. I knew that it had to come before that because I've really written about, and I think everybody knows about the early days of the restaurant through the 40th birthday book, and I, I just decided that it would be from birth to the opening of Chez Penny's. and. Then I had this idea that uh, I always think of the title first of the book, and, and so when I, 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 I... I never do that. You don't? Never. <laughs> it takes me forever to come up with a title. No, that's, that really defines what the book is about for me. And then I go backwards. Uh, so when I thought of coming to my senses, I really thought, that's what happened to me um, in my life. I just kind of woke up in a way. And then I thought the subtitle should be The Making of a Counterculture Cook because I wanted it to appeal to young people who, who are part of that counterculture right now. And I never imagined, though, that that it would be so important that I didn't make the deadline a year earlier. Now, the idea of a counterculture is real. And so, I think it coming out in September of this last year was kind of perfect timing. And I've been able to really talk about uh, how, how empowered I was by what was going on in Berkeley in the 60s and stopping the war in Vietnam and, and, and learning how to cook. Um, I think we should talk a little bit about what it was like in Berkeley. I mean, I didn't get there until the early 70s, so I wasn't there in the 60s, but I feel really sorry for kids today that they don't have that opportunity to, I mean, we all lived on nothing. And you it's could true. live on nothing. And we all decided that we were gonna follow our passions and do what we cared about. And um, I don't think kids today get to do that because there is no place that, I mean, well, I, I was probably living more extremely in the, in, <laughs> or at least more in more poverty than you were. I mean, I, and I was living in a commune where my rent was $45 a month. Um, <laughs> my husband and I lived on $3,000 a year for 10 years in Berkeley, for the two of us. Um, but it meant that we had enormous freedom. And it 
meant that you could open a restaurant like Chez Panisse. And, you know, one of the things that's so wonderful about this book is that you see someone opening a restaurant with no business idea at all. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of the beauty of it. Um, <laughs> in a way. Uh, you know, if I had really thought about it as a business, I would have been betraying the values that we held so dear. The idea of making money was just not what it was about. And I, I never, it never even occurred to me that it wouldn't be successful if it were really tasty. I, I, I was sure that it would work. And I was sure that people would want to come because, again, it, th there were people like you who, who just knew that you had to support your friends and you would go and eat there for that purpose. One of the things that's so interesting to me is you talk about all the people who were working there in the early days and you talk about Bob Wax. And when I first got to The Swallow, his parents funded my restaurant. They funded the swallow, and one of the things in every meeting was, how much money are we going to pay back to the waxes? <laughs> and you talk about John Harris, who was in... So there was this sort of... The food community was really small. We all sort of knew each other, um, and we were all weird, in a way. I mean, they, <laughs> well, no, and it's true that um, most people didn't care that much about food, and there was this small, passionate group in Berkeley who cared and who, you know, opened the cheese board the che and Pig by the Tail and the juice bar and... Um, Pete's Coffee. And Pete's Coffee. <laughs> and, and, and we were all convinced that this was really important. Um, I mean, I, I think a big part of it that is very hard for people to understand today is that we had stopped the war in Vietnam and we really felt powerful. It's true. And we looked around for like, what's the next thing that we can do? And we looked at food and suddenly, you know, one of the things I was studying was the vertical integration of agribusiness and it really terrified me. Mm -hmm. And um, food seemed like honest work, right? I mean, you open a restaurant, it's, um, you can feel proud of what you're doing and growing your own food. I mean, we all had gardens in our backyards and um, I mean, this is long before you were actually going out and thinking organically or um, as you say in the book, Provenance wasn't one of the things, I mean, it's probably all you think about today. <laughs> it is all I think about. Um, Where did it come from? But we weren't thinking about... Well, in a way, we were in Berkeley. Uh, I wasn't, I had been to France, and I had tasted this food uh, that I never had tasted before, and it was a real awakening for me. And so when I came back to Berkeley after that time, I wanted food that tasted like that. So I was in the search for that. But, you know, Diet for a Small Planet was published in the mid-60s, I think. It was. 70, 71, I think. 71? Yeah. But those ideas were... We're around in oh, yeah, the 60s no. and so. Frankie LePay was really important to our yeah, generation. Really I mean, she, important. I mean, in where I lived, I mean, we, the idea that we were feeding 22 pounds, I think, of usable protein to cattle to get one usable pound of protein <laughs> seemed insane. And it was, it was just this eye-opening revelation that, oh, if we ate differently, there would be enough food to feed the world. I mean, that was really powerful for really, really important all of to us. Me too. And so I, I knew that those things were in, you know, they were in the back of my mind uh, when uh, Chez Panisse opened. And 
we were in a search for taste, and in that search for taste, we ended up at the doorsteps of the organic local farmers and ranchers. But the other thing that this book makes really clear is that the difference between you and the rest of us mm -hmm. was that you had a really aesthetic approach to it. I mean, your writing on lighting in this book <laughs> is amazing. Um, talk about lighting a little bit. <laughs> I'm just feeling it right now. <laughs> No, I, uh, I'm, it's, it's really, really important to me because I think you can make a room feel great with the simplest kind of lighting. I mean, lighting a candle um, at a dinner table can make the whole room just and the way people look. And I just thought if I could light the restaurant in that way that, that you could see the food and you could see each other in a beautiful way that 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 would be part of the restaurant's seduction if you will that that it was like for me i was a montessori teacher and i always learned about preparing the classroom so that when the kids came in that they would fall in love with learning and so I was preparing Chez Panisse in that same way, and I wanted it to smell good. It was, I was obsessed with, with, you know, I would burn rosemary in the restaurant to make it smell good. And, and I wanted it to be beautiful. And you talk about clothing, too. You talk about Jackie and <laughs> and you know how people dress and every time you introduce somebody you know, jerry budrick comes in you talk about his clothing and um the rest of us in berkeley weren't thinking <laughs> in an aesthetic way uh, well and, you 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 have to remember that i went to france and it really <laughs> changed my life and there was kind of i mean this was when France was a slow food culture. I mean, kids came home for two hours to eat with their parents for lunch. Alice, Alice, I went to French schools for four <laughs> years. Um, you didn't notice I, any it, of this? It did not have the same, I mean, it certainly <laughs> affected how I thought about food, but it, it didn't change my whole aesthetic. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, but we you didn't know, go I, to the same restaurants, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but there was oh, we, it's a beautiful tablecloth and uh, kind of that pale peach color, pink tablecloth, and real napkins. I don't know. I was Even eating at Routier, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was great food, but I, not so beautiful. And and you and you talk about like what David, you know, his his aesthetic sense and what it meant to you. Well, David Goins really influenced me about, about, about a lot of things, but particularly about um, the way things were written, about signage, about, about typeface, about um, the, there was a particular way to design things so that they were really legible and I learned calligraphy from him and he was a very strict teacher but, very. But, but the thing is that you really were open to this I mean my father was a book designer he designed the American edition of Ulysses I grew <laughs> up with typography it never <laughs> influenced me in any particular way um, you, you were like a sponge for aesthetics. I mean, it, I, I, it's really in your nature. And I think it's, I mean, just the way you really want to find the perfect food for every single person. I mean, I've always been convinced that you think that if you can just find the single perfect flavor for every person, you will change their lives and they will understand what flavor is about. And you never stop trying. That's true. Uh, and a lot, and, 
And a lot of, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, flavor is important for you, but the whole, everything, the whole package. And, um, I, you know, I think that's a very big part of what the success of Chez Panisse has been down the years. I mean, I think, you know, people talk about how you went out and, you know, found organic food and encouraged um, farmers, and that's important, but you also um, created a really beautiful environment for people, for both the people who worked there. I mean, you, you made a family there um, that continues to this day. Um, and you wanted beauty in more than just flavor, and you wanted it in every way. But I wanted it in my own life in my own everyday life. I, I think about when, when we rebuilt uh, the restaurant after the fire and uh, we had burned down the wall between the dining room and the kitchen. And I guess I always wanted that wall down. <laughs> and, and maybe I was part of starting the fire. I was on the grill that night. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I always wanted, I felt sort of punished being in the kitchen and cooking and not being able to see the people that were eating the food in the dining room and not being able to see the sunset out the front windows of the restaurant. That why should the people in the kitchen not have that beautiful Vermeer light coming in? And why shouldn't the customers be allowed to really see how their food was being prepared. But it was always, you know, I was always thinking about what I wanted sort of for myself if I were a cook in the kitchen. Or we made a table for people to sit around for their staff meal because I wanted to eat that way. I had remembered that when I was in France, the before the lunch, and you could walk into a restaurant, and there was a table all set for the staff. Before, to, you, I, surely you saw that. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And the cooks all eating, and they ate together, and then they began the service. And so a lot of it, uh, I mean, Carrie Glenn, who does the flowers for the restaurant, she would go forage to find just what was alive and beautiful in Berkeley at that moment. And, and so I, you know, we were always cooking all day and all night. We weren't out, you know, in nature. And she brought nature into the restaurant. And so you, it reinforced what we were cooking to have an enormous branch of quince, like right now in the restaurant, and we're making, making things of spring right now, and it's, it's such a delight for me uh, to be in that environment. Okay, I want, I want to talk about something that I don't think you and I have discussed since those days, but do you remember when you decided we should start a cooking school? Yeah. <laughs> so, no. No, we had all know. these meetings with Jim Nasikas and Marion Cunningham oh, <laughs> and Cecilia and you and me. This is about early 80s and you had this notion of starting a cooking school that would begin in the, in the garden and that do you not remember this yeah, at all? You know, I do remember. I didn't realize that Jim Nisikas and, and Marion were there, but I, I had a friend of mine uh, uh, sent me a, a whole um, description of my idea for a cooking school where people would work in the garden for the first six months before they ever came, came into the kitchen. Is that part of that? And that, then, yeah. then they would look at the ingredients and then ultimately they were beginning to prepare. But I, I still think that's a great way to begin. I mean, I, I, so we had these very earnest meetings in Jack <laughs> London Square and we would meet like once a month and I mean, 
it, it was kind of serious and it never went anywhere. But it kind of <laughs> amazes me that th that still doesn't exist. It's true. I mean, why doesn't it exist? I mean, isn't this what we need to Absolutely. really, you know, I mean, as you once said to me, your ideal restaurant would be, um, you would give people a bottle of olive oil, really good <laughs> olive oil and really good vinegar, and you would lead them into a beautiful garden full of lettuces, and you would say, there it is, help yourself. <laughs> Maybe a little salt, too. <laughs> But um, I, I, I think you probably know about Bali Malu Cooking School in yes. Ireland. But that comes closest to the vision um, that I have about learning to cook. And they have a huge garden and they have, um, they have, they make cheese there, they have chickens and the whole nine yards and they, uh, people, who come really have that experience of, of um, with, with the animals. But don't you think if we could convince the CIA in Hyde Park that this would be a great curriculum, it would change? I mean, because they are turning out the people who are feeding middle America, really. I have suggested it. <laughs> So how, how did you come to the idea of the edible schoolyards? Well, um, Fanny was born, my daughter. And I started to think about what her future would be. And um, I wondered where she would go to school and I was really, that was on my mind. What are we teaching our children? And then every day I went past the Martin Luther King Junior Middle School in Berkeley on my way to Chez Panisse. And the school looked abandoned with graffiti on the walls and looked completely untended. And uh, so I remarked on that with, in an interview and the principal of the school called me into his office. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Smith, that was Neil Smith, and that was 23 years ago. And I, I think he thought I could help um, plant a garden. And uh, we took a walk around the school, and right then and there, I kind of had the whole vision which, again, I, I think that way, the big way, and then I work back to how it can happen. But I saw this big piece of land. It was built on 17 acres in 1921 for 500 children, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And now there are 1,000 kids, and um, they speak at home 22 different languages, it's English as a second language uh, um, class, and I mean population that comes from all, all around Berkeley. And um, this piece of property had been completely neglected in the back, and so I pointed out, oh, Neil, a garden there, you could have classes where you could teach math and science in the, in the garden. And then I said, well, we have to build a kitchen classroom too. And, and they could learn a language, uh, cooking in the kitchen or math or history. And I was going on and on and I looked out to this blacktop and I said, well, we could build a cafeteria. <laughs> we'll call it for the Center for the Studies of Gastronomic Sciences. And he said, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> and uh, where, of course, I was going to give everybody a free school lunch. And they would eat together at the table. And they would be given credit for eating it. Uh, and, <laughs> I, uh, and I didn't hear from him. <laughs> but six months later, he called me back. And he said, uh, he said, Okay, Alice, 
uh, I said, it's either all or nothing, Neil. That is, does tend to be your way. <laughs> <laughs> it's either all or nothing. Cafeteria, classrooms, integrated this, free school lunch. He said, Alice, I really believe in the vision. And we will do that. But let's just talk about a garden. <laughs> let's just, it'll be our little secret. Free school lunch. And so here we are. Here we are. And it, it's amazing what has come to pass because it was an idea that was so beautifully realized by these incredible teachers that, that Esther Cook being one of the first ones and she's still there. And every day they breathe life into this idea. And it's always... It's not about cooking or gardening, per se. It's about a better way to learn math or science, the academic subjects. And they really learn them. I say, you know, that any of those kids could give a TED talk after <laughs> three years at the, in the edible schoolyard. I mean, they're, they're just falling in love with nature and they're falling in love with learning. And it's a beautiful thing. It's almost as if they've been deprived. So let's talk a little bit about where we are now. I, I did a panel a few months ago with Sam Cass, um, who, if you don't know, was, was the person in the Obama White House who, who came in to feed the family and then helped Obama and helped Michelle with um, the Let's Move movement and the garden and all of that. And he was really angry. I mean, he said, you know, it will, it's going to be a long time. We had somebody in the White House for eight years who really cared about food. And it's going to be a long time before we have anybody else who cares that much about food, and we did not build a movement. We did not hire lawyers, make policy, etc. And we blew it. And um, I feel like one of the few movements that keeps going, I mean, he's right, we didn't hire lawyers and make policy, as, as the environmental movement did. Um, they were prepared when the Obamas got in there. But we're a smaller movement, a newer movement than the environmental movement. And we squandered that time. And I think the one place that we haven't is in school food. I mean, I think it's the one sort of hopeful sign on the horizon of um, what we can do with food, because that really seems to be moving forward. And talk a little bit about what your latest mission is. Well, I've always, as I said, been part of the counterculture, and I'm not looking to the government to, to make the rules and implement them. I am the good rules. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just, I think we have to be the change we want to make. We have to do it. And we realized that when we were uh, experimenting and trying to fit into that little minuscule budget of, of the, um, uh, free, the, the school lunch reimbursement, that if we went directly to the organic farmers without any middleman and worked with them, that we could buy organic milk and chicken legs and various fruits and all kinds of things that the kids love. Um, with, you know, if, if we, and gave the money directly to those farmers and proved that organic food isn't too expensive, one, and that we could have that interaction 
very successfully, as we've done with Chez Penny's for, you know, 47 years. We buy directly. And at fast food culture would have us believe that it's too difficult. It is not. You know, in 19, maybe 80, 79, it was one of the first articles I ever wrote. I did a piece about school lunch in California. And I talked, I wrote about four different school programs. They all had exactly the same budget. The woman who ran the Oakland School Project thought that everybody who worked for her was an idiot. And that she had to make it as easy as possible and she bought everything frozen and all they had to do was you know, open up frozen packages and put it on plates and so they were basically feeding their kids fast food. The woman who ran the school pro lunch program in Santa Cruz was way ahead of her time and was convinced that, um, that additives were creating ADHD in the kids and she went to farmers and she had mostly, Mex most of the people who worked for her were Mexican women. They were cooking everything from scratch with organic food. Um, the kids loved the food. Um, then there was a woman in Roland Heights who set up a central commissary and they cooked everything from scratch, not with organic, but they cooked everything from scratch in one central commissary and then sent it out to, to the various schools. Um, it was fascinating to me because they all had exactly the same budgets and the same guidelines. And it was proof that you could do anything within those guidelines exactly. if you were creative. Exactly. If you don't have the restrictions that, that are part of that pyramid. I mean, I almost don't want to take the money from the reimbursement because there's so many papers you have to fill out. It is not the way I think about food. I'm always wanting to think about vegetables and, and whole grains and, and uh, vegetable substitutes for protein, I mean proteins of vegetables and grains. Um, and I, I think that the, the foods around the world which have always been considered nutritious, uh, affordable, easy to grow, available. Those are the kinds of meals that I would imagine that we could serve. And if it were connected with the kids' studies, and they were studying the Silk Road in India, they might be eating the food of India, they might be eating a whole wheat papadum, or they might be eating the food of the Middle East, uh, tabbouleh salad and hummus. And one thing that we have learned from the Edible Schoolyard Project, aside from if they grow it, they cook it, they all eat it, besides that, the, the one thing we've learned is they generally all like the very simple food that cultures globally have eaten, both for their nutrition and for taste. Do you know about Dan Barber's new Yes, project? I'm fascinated it's, it's by it. It's <laughs> so great. So if you don't all know, Dan Barber is a chef in New York, and he, he believes that seeds are the real way to change America, and he has started a company just this week <laughs> where they are growing, he has, gro he has seed breeders breeding seeds for flavor. And, and they, for nutrition. And, and for nutrition. The two together. And um, right now they have five different seeds that they're selling, but they're available to anyone, you can buy them, they're, they they aren't patenting them. They're they're totally organic, and, and it's it fascinating because it turns out that one of the things that happens is that most of the organic seeds that you can go, buy today start with non-organic. I mean, they develop them, 
and and these are they're starting totally from scratch. It's all organic. He's he's, um, and they're much more nutritious if they start from right from the beginning, and um, it's such an interesting idea. Well, he came and spoke at an edible education course that we've been doing at Cal, um, which is streamed, and you can listen to all the people that that, that have... Uh, I mean, this has been happening over about six years at the university, and now it's in the Haas Business School. So uh, Dan Barber came just two weeks ago, and he talked about this project. And of course, in this country, we've always been breeding seeds for shipability and for size, never for taste. If you can imagine, it's not for taste or nutrition. And he talked about the squash, his honey nut squash. And he said, I never knew that, that it was important to pick the squash when it was ripe because that's when it has the most nutrition. And so he developed with this breeder a squash that you could tell in the field when it was ripe. So it began green, and then it got more orange. And when you have a butternut squash out there in the field, you don't know whether it is ripe or not. And now you can tell with this new little squash, but so fascinating. Yeah, it's, it, so I, I, I want to talk about, I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember, I mean, this is also, I think, the late 70s. I knew that Alice was getting her produce from the Chino Ranch. Um, and it was being sent up because you... But there was nobody that was growing that was growing vegetables like those that I had tasted in France. And a French guy, friend of ours, sent me a box of Arica Vert, and I just nearly cried. And I said, we have to buy these all the time for shipments. <laughs> and so we had somebody who came up. Uh, who was making deliveries of another kind every week, and he agreed to bring us boxes of, uh, of, of produce then. So I wanted to go do an article about Lucinos because I was fascinated. And I called them, and they said, well, we don't talk to the press. Um, so I called Alice and said, you know, if you, next time you go to... Lucino Ranch, can I come with you? And she said yes, and we went down there, and we spent a weekend down there. And I think you were just starting to see Stephen then. Because you called me at the last minute, and you said, I hope you don't mind if I bring this guy. I don't remember that. <laughs> um, so the three of us went there. And um, what I remember so clearly is, first of all, Everything we had there was, I mean, you have to remember, this is like the 70s when you couldn't get great produce if you were an ordinary person. And, you know, strawberries were these big, clunky things that had no flavor and no aroma and were white in the middle. And here we are eating corn that's so delicious. We're just standing in the fields eating corn raw. And Tom Chino did this, the... Chino tomato test where he would grow 30 tomatoes every year and make you taste through them all and say which you thought was the best. And the next year he would grow the one that, would, that everybody had decided was the best and 29 others. And he kept trying to yeah. look for perfect tomatoes. But right at the end of the time that we were there, we went out and picked strawberries for dinner at Chez Panisse. And the three of us got on the plane, each carrying a flat of strawberries. And it was a fairly small plane that flew from San Diego to Oakland. And the aroma of those berries filled the plane. And one by one, every single person on that plane got up 
and came over and begged for a berry. You know? <laughs> and they all said, I forgot what strawberries yeah. smelled like. And I watched Alice giving away <laughs> dessert at Chez Panisse <laughs> with this huge smile on her face because she was teaching these people about flavor. She was bringing back a flavor memory. Well, I always believe that if Bill Clinton had just eaten a Suncrest peach <laughs> at, its, at its perfect moment, that, that he would have had a, <laughs> an epiphany. <laughs> and I think this is the moment when we should take questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Microphones on both sides of the aisle. First question is in front. Oh, hi. Thank you very much. I'm over here okay. uh, to your left. Hi. Thank you both for your writing, for your food, for everything you've done. I'm a kid who was raised on Carib and lucky enough to have some access to good food, and uh, your influence certainly helped. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about influencing sort of mass media around food. We have the Food Network and Bravo's Top Chef and all of that that so many people consume and um, have taken food while making it somewhat more accessible. Also, I think, turned it into these food wars and competitions, and I'm curious about your thoughts about how to better infiltrate and shape that thinking as well. Thank you. Well, I just have to say that we do an Iron Chef at uh, the Edible Schoolyard Project. And I've always wanted to do it this way on television, where they're not judged just on taste and presentation. They're judged on how well they work as a group to produce it, how well they clean up, <laughs> how well... <laughs> I, I want to have a show where, where the chefs are judged by the children, where they have to really um, be judged differently, and they're using... Well, I have to say, I mean, I was a judge for a few seasons on Top Chef Masters, oh, yeah. and we did do an episode where the chefs were judged by children. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that work out? Well, it, it was kind of surprising, actually, um, because the one who won um, did something that was so counterintuitive that you thought every kid would hate, and in fact, the kids were much more adventurous than anybody thought that they would be in their, in their tastes. Well, he did an eggplant jello. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this because, so um, I mean, I, I really think that food culture in America changed dramatically with the advent of the food net, TV Food Network. Um, and that food television started out being really stupid, but it, it, it's kind of like the way we all learn to drink wine starting with the Flying Nun and Matus, And then we went up. And I mean, if you look at what's happened to food television, I mean, it's gone from really, you know, stuff that just makes you cringe um, because it's so completely dumb to stuff that's kind of wonderful now. I mean, there, there's more and better food television all the time. but. Because of food television, we have a generation, we have the smartest generation of eaters that this country has ever raised. Um, and it, it wrenched food into popular culture in a way that I never could have imagined when I started writing about food. But again, I'm, I just feel like if we have that vicarious experience of of cooking on television. Most people don't get beyond that and get really into the kitchen. I think we're doing this, we're eating 
kind of fast food in front of the television and watching this entertainment. I, I just remember Julia Chud, and nothing has ever been like that for me since. See, I, I, think, I think the stuff that's getting done now is so much better. I mean, well, like, you uh, know. Um, I, 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 no, but, but I'd like to know whether there's anybody who's really talking about the provenance of food. I, I think there's Deeply. almost everything. I mean, I mean. What, it, what programs are you thinking about? Well, <laughs> I mean. Mind of a Chef, um, the the new uh, David Chang's new Ugly Delicious. I mean, he doesn't he, ever talk about the provenance of food. He's, he's I haven't bringing, watched the whole series. It's I mean, have you watched bringing, it? It just came on. How have you know, watched it all? I know because everybody said, "Oh my God, he's." Uh, you, you know, I wish he were using his celebrity to talk about that. I mean, he's talking about politics and race and gender. I mean, he's talking about stuff that is. He's important. talking about Domino's Pizza. No, I'm sorry. He, did. He, 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 is, he is talking about the no. Im impact of immigration on American food in a way that is impactful and important, I think. And you know, and you look at some of some of the the chef's tables things, and um, no, I, mean, I, I, I think I, there's no, great I, food TV. No, I I love David Chang. <laughs> I've I really like him very, very much, and I think that's incredibly important to talk about that. But not to the exclusion of, uh, of or to give the impression that, that, you know, that the food truck food is valuable and not really go to, the, to its source. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Are we supporting a whole system that, that is, um, you know, slavery for immigrants uh, on the other end? I mean, we're talking about fast food nation. I mean, it's shocking what's going on in the, in the, uh, the, the corporations that are, that are producing meat across the country. But it's a big tent. There is lots of room for pieces about provenance, pieces about um, justice, social justice for food workers. Um, I mean, the thing is that we are talking about all these things in a way we never have before. And it, you can't have everybody doing exactly the same thing. I mean, my particular concern is actually what's happening with farm workers. And there's not very much being done about that, but people are talking about it for the first time in the last couple of years. I mean, there was an American crime, a whole series about what was happening to farm workers. And I mean, I think that these things are coming into the culture in a way that they never have before. And I think, you know, to say that everybody should be doing the same thing is not the way to be looking at it. But I think we have to all know about where our food comes from, Ruth, because we're either supporting a system that is building community and taking care of the land for the future, or we're not. And, and everybody's food decisions every day are terribly, terribly important. And I think taste and tradition and everything else comes after that and from that, from the good values of those farmers and the people who and take care of their And that's important for you to talk about, but everybody doesn't have to talk about that. I mean, I think the Me Too think movement is really important <laughs> and should be talked about. And I think that um, gender issues are important and should be talked about. And you know, people need to talk about the things that are most important to them. And everybody doesn't have to have the same conversation. No, I do understand that. But don't you think that a lot of it comes from the food production place? That, that those, I 
feel like at the beginning with the farmers that we dealt with, I was always telling them what to plant. And, and, and here they are now telling us what to eat and how to take care of their lion by, by the choices that we make. And their values, the values of the way they take care of the people on the farm and the work that they do, the understanding of how hard it is. And, and that's all come into the restaurant and helped us humanize what we do. And so I, I just, um, I'm not doing this to any kind of exclusion of these other conversations. I'm not. I think somehow it all goes back to, to how, how we're treating people in the production of what we all eat and we have to eat every day to live. I agree with that, but I also think, you know, when you look at a Chef's Table episode of, of, about Massimo Bottura, who is trying to feed poor people, that, I mean, he's not talking about provenance, he's talking about something else, and that's what's important to him. And I think, you know, we need all of these voices because there are a lot of issues we all have to deal with. And, you know, when Dan does um, food waste, that's important. And, you know, the fact is that we are hearing about all these things in a way that we just didn't five years ago. I think we should take yeah. another question. <laughs> the next question is on your right. <laughs> oh. Hi, um, I'm a chef from Canada. I flew down to actually attend this event. <laughs> uh, Ruth, I wanted to, I really loved your poetic tweeting a few years ago. I really, I actually, every day I, I look for it. So I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and Alice, um, 20 years ago, I was an intern at Chez Panisse, and you know, when you talked about discovering flavor in France that sort of clicked with you, that happened to me in the kitchen with Russell Moore with Chino Ranch corn, actually. Um, and we ate it raw. And from my experience, I did, we didn't do that. That was foreign to me. Uh, the flavors that uh, Chez Panisse introduced to me were completely foreign. I wasn't in it for the environment. I've been in it for the food and the taste ever since. Um, and I brought it back over the last 20 years, and uh, I just wanted you to know how deeply it's affected the community in my region, uh, the idea of taste and locality and providence. Where is your restaurant? Uh, it's in Hamilton, in Ontario, just outside of Toronto. We have a few. And we have a 100-acre organic farm as well um, because of that. Farming is yeah, hard. <laughs> <laughs> my question, my question, I just wanted you to know that, um, but my question is, why is there not more Chez Panisses? Meaning, how come you haven't opened another one? <laughs> well, there are a lot of Chez Panisses, really. Um, it's a philosophy of food. It's not, it, it, it's, it's about, uh, you know, eating things in season, buying things organically, uh, you know, being, uh, cooking simply. Uh, these are all values. Uh, taking care of your staff, uh, collaborating in terms of, of of the taste of the dishes. Everybody, everybody participating in how the final dish is going to turn out. All of these ideas have really been around since the beginning of civilization, really. I, I mean, these aren't new ideas. These are human values. And I, I, I think that once you hold on to those, you can create a place wherever you are. Uh, somebody in the business school went around, they never talked to me, and they tried to find all the restaurants that had started because somebody came from Chez Panisse and they came up with 585. Now, uh, it's, um, 
it's so beautiful to see how people in different climates and different cultures interpret this. And uh, I, I think there are many, 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 many restaurants that have this philosophy now. And I think Ruth would agree, and practically every city that I visit in the United States has farm-to-table places. And one of these fine days, we'll just call everybody out. <laughs> and we haven't done this. We, we're like, I feel like we're a little bit in the French underground. You know, we're passing notes to each other. We're loving this place, and you should go eat in that place. And, and tell them I said hello. And, and it's like you coming down here and uh, coming to this, that you're, you're connecting. And that's a network that I think is really, really important in this country. It, it, it also, it's hard. I mean, re remember the new Boonville Hotel? <laughs> Does everybody remember the new Boonville Hotel? Does anybody remember it? <laughs> I won't ever forget it. Tell it about our so Thanksgiving. Al Alice actually told me about it, and um, <laughs> it was um, Vernon had worked. We had was he an old boyfriend? Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but it was this impossible dream that Vernon and Charlene Rollins went up to Boonville and. Their idea, and this is in like, what, 79? Um, their idea was that they would raise every single thing that they served. So when you went there, if you had a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, it was the tomatoes they had grown, they'd baked the bread, they made the mayonnaise from their own eggs and olive oil and bacon from, you know, their own pay. I mean, it was everything. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a very early version of Dan Barber's um, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, except that Dan had Rockefeller money behind him. <laughs> and, um, and he had a few other people working in the kitchen. We went there for uh, a, a dinner. And uh, they didn't understand what it was to put a mise en place together. And so they basically went out to the garden once they saw you were at the table and picked the lettuce and uh, washed it and dried it. And you were sitting in the dining room and you were waiting and you were waiting and they were waiting for the chicken to lay the egg. And <laughs> We, we went there for, for Marion's birthday once, for Marion Cunningham's <laughs> birthday, and they decided to do a Mexican meal. And it was perfect, but you know, it took us three hours to get there, and then I think we sat there for five hours before there was any food. <laughs> Perfectionists. But you know, it has gotten easier because people have learned more since then, but... Um, you know, I mean, every, when, everybody thought Alice was crazy when she started. I mean, the farmers all thought she was crazy. And um, it's a hard concept, as you know. But it's so deeply gratifying. I can't tell you. Every single day, you sort of come to the food and you say, what can I do with these ingredients? And, and every time I wash the salad with these chicory lettuces right now, I almost cry. I mean, little purple mustard and spotted lime green. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just um, a thrill to eat a Kishu mandarin from Jim Churchill's farm. You know, I call it t Kishu diplomacy. I send the people that I'm trying to influence in the freezing cold months of the East Coast <laughs> a box of Kishus. And they just can't believe that there are these little fruits that are so They're sweet my, oh, and easy they to are peel. The most wonderful and, things and, ever. and they remember me. 
And so when I go to see some politician in Washington, they open the door. So, Kishu diplomacy, don't forget. The next Works question. on kids, yeah. The next question is right here. Um, yes, thank you so much. I'm curious about the, um, how you reconcile these concepts with regard to here in the Bay Area, I think one out of five or one out of four children are food insecure, and that there's families that are really struggling just to feed their family. So how do you think, I mean, it's hard to compete when you see like McDonald's can give you a whole meal for $3. How do you see us moving forward where we can really um, deal with this constant food insecurity and also enrich the food when people, I think, are feeling desperate and just want to eat what's cheap and available. Yeah. No, I completely understand that, and it's the reason that I want to go to the public school system and begin a kindergarten and feed every single child breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack for free. For free. And that, uh, I, th I know, uh, and I think probably, Ruth, would you agree with me, that learning how to cook is the most affordable way to eat and to feed children nutritious food. But we need to engage them in the cooking too. And I've heard about a lot of projects where they uh, bring the parents and the kids together and they learn to cook um, very simple, basic food. And I think once you put yourself in those circumstances, you want to go back again. You do. And of course, participating in any kind of community garden to grow your own food is you know, a great reward. But we need to begin in our public school, which is, from my point of view, our last truly democratic institution in this country. And, and the other thing is we really need to understand how much our tax policy affects what we eat. I mean, I, I think that we are a long way from understanding how dominated we are by tax policy on food. And there is a reason why going to McDonald's is cheap. It's not really cheap. It's cheap because we're subsidizing that food. And, I mean, we have to do some real rethinking of many things, I and mean, one of them is that. And the other thing is there's a kind of craziness in how we eat in nuclear families. And if we could learn to cook communally in some way, it would make everybody's lives easier. <laughs> I mean, I've always thought that. You know, if, if you know, people in a building, you know, one person cooked for five families, and you, so you, if you were a mother, a, like a single mother with four children, if you pooled your money with other people in your building, and one of you cooked every night a week, mm -hmm. and so you're, you're really only cooking one night a week, but your kids are, it would be much cheaper, it would be easier. I mean, we really need to think of different ways of thinking about the ways that we feed ourselves. But of course, um, corporate America doesn't want us to do that because it's not profitable for them. That's right. The next question's in the back on your right. Okay. Um, question would be, nowadays dealing with social media between Twitter and Instagram, how do you feel it impacts a restaurateur and how, and, and Ruth mentioned to, about lighting uh, and with Alice and, and you had and you had that wonderful comment but I mean in restaurant design in everything coming out about everyone taking pictures of food how does that change someone from either an existing restaurant or if you were to open a new restaurant like what are your thoughts on that well, I'm not a restaurateur and I think Alice is probably the last person who's <laughs> thinking about people taking pictures of her food or whether the Yelpers like her restaurant or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, we have a little line at the bottom of the menu 
which says, please refrain from using your cell phone it's in the restroom. And it's not because I don't want them. They could come in the kitchen and take a picture <laughs> of the food. It's not that I don't want that somebody to take a picture. It's, it's that it really disrupts to see a screen at another table. It really aesthetically disrupts it and to have another conversation while you're eating. I think it uh, really changes the way people relate to one another, and I'm, I, I really want to put the cell phones get away when, when you're eating a meal. Well, since I do have a blog that I do rec record <laughs> my meals on, I do, f I take a lot of pictures of food, and I, I do think that the visual is starting to take over in a pernicious way. I mean, I do think that chefs are increasingly thinking about what the food looks like, um, you know, how it's going to appear in the photos as opposed to how it tastes. Um, and I, I don't think that that's a good thing, but I do find, you know, I mean, some things that really haven't tasted that good look great in the camera. And... Um, it's too bad. I mean, in terms of, you know, what social media does for restaurants, um, I think overall, one of the things that's great about social media is, you know, when Craig Claiborne, who pretty much invented restaurant criticism in this country, he was the loudest voice in the country. You know, if he said he liked a restaurant, everybody went there. Today, if you go on to Yelp or any of the other social media, you have to sort of think for yourself because you know that some of those people know what they're talking about, a lot of them don't, some of them may be friends of the restaurant, some of them may be competition. Um, I think that people are becoming smarter consumers of social media because they have to, because you just can't read it and believe it. And that's ultimately a good thing. We have time for one last question on your left. We are hearing so much about sexual harassment in kitchens, and we are finding out that prominent uh, female and male chefs are allowing and fostering a culture of abuse in their kitchens. And I would like to hear your opinion about the situation and how that can be changed. Thank you. Well, I've um, tried to run a restaurant that was very collaborative. And I've always believed that there should be both men and women in the kitchen in some kind of balance. I, I'm in a very, um, you know, uh, privileged place in a way, being the woman who owns the restaurant. But I've never, um, I never wanted, uh, could tolerate a, a kind of, of um, what would I like to say, um, any kind of harassment. Although, you know, the restaurant business is a dangerous place. <laughs> it's, it's a place of drinking. It's a place of hard work and, and just letting it all down afterwards. And it's, it's um, um, and a lot of really strong macho men in there too. Uh, it, it kind of breathes uh, um, an environment that that could uh, really be abusive. So we need to have the conversations in the restaurant. We need to let everyone know that that we're looking out, that we're taking care, that we're supporting each other. And uh, I 
I think it begins with having that group conversation within the restaurant. And this has been a big wake-up call for everybody. I mean, I, I think, I mean, as someone who started working in restaurants and then became a freelance writer, it was certainly worse as a freelance writer um, dealing with editors than it was in any restaurant that I ever worked in. Um, and, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of this in restaurants because there's that macho bro culture that was we all sort of enjoyed for a while. I mean, it, we, we allowed it to happen and we thought it was funny and we liked the, those guys. But it's really, it is across every business, not just in America, but in the world. And this is the first time in my lifetime where I think we are starting to hold men accountable and they are starting to understand that there is going to be a price for this kind of behavior. And women are starting to feel like, no, I shouldn't have to put up with this. And um, it's about time and it, I think I hope that my, grand, my granddaughters will never have to deal with the kind of stuff that everybody in my generation just accepted no matter where they were working. They thought it was fine if guys you know, said, oh, I, I'm hiring her because she's got great legs. And we all just thought, oh, yeah, all right, that's, a, that's an okay thing to say. And um, I don't think it's any worse in restaurants than it is any place else. I only say that because there's so much alcohol and, and, and drugs. That and, and, and at least there was when I was... Uh, no, and, and because in also the, the restaurant model was based on these macho French guys who wouldn't let women in their kitchens. Yes, right. um, and, you know, for whom it was just okay to be a macho French guy and, you know, that's what the American restaurant model was for the longest time. Um, but, you know, I think it's coming screeching to a halt. I really do, because there, there are huge economic consequences for these people yeah. now. And that's the difference. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.